Hey, Thrilling Suspense fantasy listeners and readers, today's Clark Ashtober offering is The Demon Flower, a science fiction story which reads like fantasy. To enjoy this story most, try to imagine the colors described as our adventure ensues. The Demon of the Flower by Clark Ashton Smith Lying one summer night below the stars, when the Milky Way was spanning the sapphire zenith, and the wind had fallen asleep in the high, somber pines, I heard this tale as a whispering born from strange worlds beyond the scorpion. Not as the plants and flowers of the earth, growing peacefully beneath a simple sun, were the blossoms of the planet Lofi, Coiling and uncoiling in double dawns, tossing tumultuously to enormous suns of jade green and ballas ruby orange, swaying and weltering in rich twilights, they resembled fields of rooted servants that dance eternally to an otherworldly music. Many were small and furtive, and crept in the fashion of vipers on the low ground. Others were tall as pythons, rearing proudly to the jeweled light in hieratic postures. Some were like abdominous wyverns, with long slender throats and coronals of scroll-shaped antennae, and some bore the far-off likeness of pygmy cockadrills with high carmine-tinted combs. The flowers grew with single or double stems that burgeoned into hydra heads, or triple or quadruple stems that joined again to put forth a single blossom. They were frilled and festooned with varicolored leaves that suggested the wings of flying lizards, the pennons of fairy lances, the phylacteries of an alien sacerdotalism. They bloomed with petals that issued like flaming tongues from ebon mouths, or curled in scarlet wattles as of wild dragons turned to plants by a wizard's spell, or floated on the air in deep reticulations as of fleshy nets of matter and rose, or hung aloft like bucklers of exotic war. They were armed with venomous darts, with deadly fangs, and many possessed the power of fatal constriction. All were weirdly alive and sentient, were malignly restless and alert, save in the irregular, infrequent winters when Lofi hung at its twofold aphelion. Then they ceased their perennial tossing in a brief torpor, and folded their monstrous petals beneath the rays that fall obliquely from remote poles. The flowers were the lords of Lofi, and all other life existed only by their sufferance. The people of the world had been their inferiors from unrecorded cycles, and even in the oldest myths there was no suggestion that any other order of things had ever prevailed, and the plants themselves, together with the fauna of mankind and lo-fi, gave immemorial obeisance to that supreme and terrible flower known as the Vurqual, in which a tutelary demon, more ancient than the twin suns, was believed to have made its immortal avatar. The Vurqual was served by a human priesthood, chosen from amid the royalty and aristocracy of Lofi. In the heart of the chief city, Lospar, in an equatorial realm, it had grown from antiquity on the summit of a high pyramid of sable terraces that overloomed the town like the hanging gardens of some greater Babylon, crowded with the lesser but deadly floral forms. At the center of the broad apex, the Vurqual stood alone in a basin level with the surrounding platform of black mineral. The basin was filled with a compost in which the dust of royal mummies formed an essential ingredient. The tall, daemonian flower sprang from a bulb so old, so encrusted with the growth of centuries that it resembled an urn of stone. Above this there rose the gnarled and mighty stalk that had displayed in earlier times the bifurcation of a mandrake, but whose halves had now grown together into a scaly, furrowed thing like the tail of some mythic sea monster. The stock was variegated with hues of greening bronze, of antique copper, with the sere yellows and burnt matters of tropic autumn, the livid blues and deathly purples of carnal corruption. 
it ended in a crowd of stiff, blackish leaves, banded and spotted with poisonous metallic white, and edged with sharp serrations as of savage weapons. From below the crown there issued a long, sinuous arm, scaled like the main stem, and serpentining downward and outward to terminate in the huge upright bowl of a bizarre blossom, as if the arm, in sardonic fashion, should hold out a hellish beggar's cup. Abhorrent and monstrous was the bowl, which, like the leaves, was legended to renew itself at intervals of a thousand years. It smoldered at the base with sullen ruby steeped in sepulchral shadow. It lightened into zones of sultry dragon's blood, into belts of the rose of infernal sunset, on the fluted swelling sides, and it flamed at the rim to a yellowish nacarat red, like the ichor of salamander devils. To one who dared to peer within, the deep grail was lined with funereal violet, blackening toward the bottom, pitted with myriad pores, and striated with turgescent veins of sulphurous green, swaying slowly in a weird lethal hypnotic rhythm, with a deep and solemn sibilation, the Vurqual dominated the city of Lospar and the world of Lofi. Below, on the tiers of the pyramid, the thronged ophidian plants kept time to this rhythm in their tossing and hissing, and far beyond Lospar, to the poles of the planet, and in all its longitudes, the fields of living blossoms obeyed the sovereign tempo of the Vurqual. Boundless was the power exercised by this being over the people who, for want of a better name, I have called the humankind of Lofi. Many and frightful were the legends that had gathered through aeons about the Vurqual, and dire was the sacrifice demanded each year at the summer solstice by the demon, the filling of its proffered cup with the life-blood of a priest or priestess, chosen from amid the assembled hierophants who passed before the Vurqual till the poised cup, inverted and empty, descended like a devil's mitre on the hapless head of one of their number. Lunithi, king of the realms about Lospar, and high priest of the Vurqual, was the last, if not the first, of his race to rebel against this singular and sinister domination. There were doubtful myths of some primordial ruler who had dared to refuse the required sacrifice, and whose people, in consequence, had been decimated by a mortal war with the serpentine plants which, obeying the angry demon, had uprooted themselves everywhere from the soil and had marched on the cities of Lofi, slaying or vampirizing all who fell in their way. Lunithi, from childhood, had obeyed implicitly and without question the will of the floral overlord, had offered the stated worship, had performed the necessary rites. To withhold them would have been blasphemy. He had not dreamt of rebellion till, at the time of the annual choosing of the victim, and thirty sons before the date of his nuptials with Nala, priestess of the Vurqual, he saw the hesitant, inverted grail come down in deathly crimson on the fair head of his betrothed. A mute and sorrowful consternation, a sullen, recalcitrant dismay which he sought to smother even in his own heart, was experienced by Lunithi. Nala, dazed and resigned, in a mystic inertia of despair, accepted her doom without question. But a blasphemous doubt formed itself surreptitiously in the mind of the king. Scarcely he dared admit the thought to full consciousness, lest the demon should know by means of its telepathic powers and visit him some baleful retribution. Trembling with his own impiety, he asked himself if there was not some way in which he could save Nala from the sacrificial knife, could cheat the demon of its ghastly tribute. To do this, and escape with impunity to himself and his subjects, he knew infallibly that he must strike at the very life of the monster, which was believed to be deathless and invulnerable. 
it seemed impious even to wonder concerning the truth of this unanimous belief which had long assumed the force of a religious tenet among the peoples of Lofi. Amid such reflections as these, Lunithi remembered an old myth about the existence of a neutral and independent being known as the Ocleth, a demon coeval with the Verkwal, and allied neither to man nor to the flower creatures. This being was said to dwell beyond the desert of Afom, in the otherwise unpeopled mountains of white stone that are never visited by snow and which lie above the habitat of the Ophidian blossoms. In latter days, at least, no man had seen the Auklith, for the journey through Afom was a thing not lightly to be undertaken, but this entity was supposed to be immortal, and it lived apart and alone, meditating upon all things and interfering never with their processes. However, it was said to have given, in earlier times, valuable advice concerning affairs of state to a certain king who had gone forth from Lospar to its lair among the white crags. In his grief and desperation, Lunithi resolved to seek the Auklith, and to question it anent the possibility of slaying the Vorkwal. If, by any mortal means, the demon could be destroyed, he would remove from Lofi the long-established tyranny whose shadow fell upon all things from the Sable Pyramid. It was necessary for him to proceed with utmost caution, to confide in no one, to veil his very thoughts at all times from the occult scrutiny of the Vurukwal. In the interim of five days between the choosing of the victim and the consummation of the sacrifice, he must carry out his mad plan. Unattended, and disguised as a simple herder, Lunithi left his palace during the brief night of universal three-hour slumber, and stole forth toward the desert through fields comparatively free of the serpentine growths. In the dawn of the ballast ruby sun, he had reached the pathless waste, and was toiling painfully over its knife-sharp ridges of dark stone like the waves of a mounting ocean petrified in storm. Soon the rays of the green sun were added to those of the other, and Afom became a painted inferno through which Lunithi dragged his way, crawling from scarp to glassy scarp and resting at whiles in the colored shadows. There was no water anywhere, but swift mirages gleamed and faded, and the sifting sand appeared to run like rills in the bottom of deep flaming valleys. At the setting of the first sun, Lunithi came within sight of the pale mountains beyond Afom, towering like a precipice of frozen foam above the desert's darker sea. They were tinged with evanescent lights of azure and jade, and orange in the going of the yellow-red orb and the westward slanting of its binary. Then the lights melted into tourmaline and beryl, and the green sun was regnant over all till it, too, went down, leaving a twilight whose colors were those of shoaling seawater. In the gloom, Lunithi reached the foot of the lower crags, and there, exhausted, he slept till the second dawn. Rising, he began his escalade of the white mountains which rose bleak and terrible before him against the hidden suns, with cliffs that were sheer as the terraces of titans. Like the king who had gone before in the ancient myth, he found the precarious way that led upward through narrow broken chasms. At last he came to the vaster fissure, riving the heart of the white range, by which it was possible to reach the legendary lair of the Auklith. The beetling walls of the chasm rose higher and higher above him, shutting out the double daylight but creating with their pallor a wan and deathly glimmer to illumine his way through the dusk. The fissure was such as might have been cloven by the sword of a macrocosmic giant. It led downward, steepening ever like a wound that pierced the heart of Lofi. Lunithi, like all of his race, was able to exist for prolonged periods without other nutriment than sunlight and water. 
He had brought with him a metal flask filled with the aqueous element of lo-fi, from which he drank sparingly as he descended along the chasm, for, like Aphom itself, the white mountains were waterless, and he feared to touch the rills and pools of unknown fluids upon which he came at intervals in the gloom. There were sanguine-colored springs that bubbled from the walls to vanish in fathomless rifts, and sluggish brooklets of mercurial metal, green, blue, or amber, that wound beside him like liquescent serpents and then disappeared mysteriously in dark caverns. Acrid metallic vapors rose from clefts in the chasm floor, and Lunithi felt himself among strange alchemies and chemistries of nature— in this fantastic world of stone, which the plants of Lo-Fi could never invade, he seemed to have gone beyond the satanic tyranny of the Vurqual. At last he came to a clear, hueless pool that almost filled the entire width of the chasm, leaving on one side a narrow, insecure ledge along which he was forced to scramble. A fragment of the marble stone, loosened by his passing, fell into the pool as he gained the opposite edge, and the clear liquid foamed and hissed like a thousand vipers. Wondering as to its properties, and fearful of the virulent hissing, which did not subside for some time, Lunithi hurried on, and came after an interval to the end of the fissure. Here he emerged in the huge crater-like pit that was the home of the Ocleth. Fluted and columned walls went up to an overwhelming height on all sides, and the sun of orange ruby, now at zenith, was pouring down a vertical cataract of gorgeous fires and shadows. Adorced against the further wall of the pit, Lunithi beheld that fabulous being known as the Ocleth, which had the likeness of a high cruciform pillar of blue mineral, shining with its own esoteric luster. Going forward, he prostrated himself before the pillar, and then, in accents that quavered with a deep awe, he ventured to ask the desired oracle. For a while, the Ocleth maintained its aeonian silence. Peering timidly, the king perceived the twin lights of mystic silver that brightened and faded with a slow, regular pulsation in the arms of the blue cross. Then, from the lofty shining thing, by means of no visible organ, there issued a voice that was like the tinkling of mineral fragments lightly clashed together, but which somehow shaped itself into articulate words. It is possible— said the Oakleth, to slay the plant known as the Vorqual, in which an elder demon has its habitation. Though the flower has attained millennial age, it is not necessarily immortal, for all things have their proper term of existence and decay, and nothing has been created without its corresponding agency of death. I do not advise you to slay the plant." but I can furnish you with the information which you desire. In the mountain chasm through which you came to seek me, there flows a hueless spring of mineral poison, deadly to all the ophidian plant life of this world. The Ocleth went on, and told Lunithi the manner in which the poison should be prepared and administered. The chill, toneless, tinkling voice concluded, I have answered your question. If there is anything more that you wish to learn, it would be well to ask me now. Prostrating himself again, Lunithi gave thanks to the Ocleth, and considering that he had learned all that was requisite in regard to the Vorqual, he did not avail himself of the opportunity to question further the strange entity of living stone. And the Ocleth, cryptic and aloof in its termless, impenetrable meditation, apparently saw fit to vouchsafe nothing more except an answer to a direct query. Withdrawing from the marble-walled abyss, Lunithi returned in haste along the narrow chasm, till, reaching the clear pool of which the Oakleth had spoken, he paused to empty his water-flask and fill it with the angry hissing liquid. Then he resumed his journey." 
at the end of two days, after incredible fatigues and torments in the blazing hell of Aphom, he reached Lospar in the time of darkness and slumber, as when he had departed. Since his absence had been unannounced, it was supposed by everyone that he had retired to the underground Adita below the pyramid of the Vurqual for purposes of prolonged meditation, as was sometimes his wont. In fearful hope and trepidation, dreading the miscarriage of his plan and shrinking still from its audacious impiety, Lunithi awaited the night preceding that double dawn of summer solstice when, in a secret room of the Black Pyramid, the monstrous offering was to be prepared. Nala would be slain by a fellow priest or priestess, chosen by lot, and her lifeblood would drip from the channeled altar into a great cup, and the cup would then be borne with solemn rites to the Vurqual, and its contents poured into the evilly supplicative bowl of the sanguinated blossom. He saw little of Nala during that brief interim. She was more withdrawn than ever, and seemed to have consecrated herself wholly to the coming doom. To no one, and least of all to his beloved, did Lenithi dare to hint a possible prevention of the sacrifice. There came the dreaded eve, with its swiftly changing twilight of jeweled hues and its darkness hung with auroral flames. Lunithi stole across the sleeping city and entered the pyramid whose massive blackness towered amid the frail and open architecture of buildings that were little more than canopies and lattices of stone. With infinite caution, hiding his real intention in the nethermost crypts of his mind, he made the preparations prescribed by the Oakleth into the huge sacrificial cup of black metal, in a room eternally lit with stored sunlight, he emptied the seething, sibilant poison he had brought with him from the white mountains, then, opening with surgical adroitness a vein in one of his arms, he added a certain amount of his own life-fluid to the lethal potion. The blood appeared to quiet that angry venom, above whose foaming crystal it floated like a magic oil, without mingling, so that the entire cup, to all appearance, was filled with the liquid most acceptable to the satanic blossom. Bearing in his hands the black grail, Lunithi mounted a coiling stairway that led to the Vurqual's presence. His heart quailing within him, his senses swooning in chill gulfs of superstitious terror, he emerged on the lofty sable summit above the shadowy town. In a luminous azure gloom, against the weird and iridescent streamers of light that foreran the double dawn, he saw the dreamy swaying of the monstrous plant, and heard its somnolent hissing that was answered drowsily by innumerable blossoms on the terraces below. A nightmare oppression, black and tangible, seemed to flow from the pyramid and to lie in stagnant shadow on all the lands of Lo-Fi. Aghast at his own temerity, and deeming that his shrouded thoughts would surely be understood as he drew nearer, or that the Vorqual would be suspicious of an offering brought before the customary hour, Lunithi made obeisance to his floral overlord. The Vorqual vouchsafed no sign that it had deigned to perceive his presence, but the great flower-cup, with its flaring crimsons dulled to garnet and purple in the twilight, was held forward as if in readiness to receive the hideous gift. Breathless and fainting with religious fear, in a moment of suspense that seemed eternal, Lunithi poured the blood-mantled poison into the yawning cup. The venom boiled and hissed like a wizard's brew as the thirsty flower drank it up, and Lunithi saw the coiling arm draw back in sudden doubt, and tilt its demonian grail quickly as if to repudiate the sacrificial draught. It was too late, for the poison had been absorbed by the blossom's porous lining. 
The tilting motion changed in midair to an agonized writhing of the serpentine arm, and then the Verqual's huge scaly stalk and serrate leaf crown began to toss in a frenetic dance of death, waving darkly against the auroral curtains of morn. Its Deep, solemn hissing sharpened to an insupportable note, fraught with the pain of a dying devil, and looking down from the platform edge on which he crouched to avoid the swaying growth, Lunithi saw that the lesser plants on all the black terraces beneath were tossing in mad unison with their master. Like noises in an evil dream, he heard the chorus of their tortured sibilations. He dared not look again at the Vorqual till he became aware of a strange, unnatural silence, and saw that the blossoms below had ceased to writhe and were drooling limply on their stems. Then, incredulous, he knew that the Vorqual was dead. Turning in mingled horror and triumph, he beheld the flaccid stock that had fallen prone on its bed of unholy compost. He saw the sudden withering of the stiff, sordid leaves of the gross and hellish flower. Even the stony bulb appeared to collapse and crumble before his eyes. The entire stem, with its evil colors fading swiftly, shrank and fell in upon itself like a sere and empty serpent skin. At the same time, in some obscure manner, Lunithi was still aware of a presence that brooded above the pyramid. Even in the death of the Vurqual, it seemed to him that he was not alone. Then, as he stood and waited, fearing he knew not what, he felt the passing of a cold and unseen thing in the azure gloom a thing that flowed across his body like the coils of some enormous python, without sound, in dark and clammy undulations. A moment more and it was gone, and Lunithi no longer felt the brooding presence. He turned to go, and it seemed that the dying night was ominous of an unconceived terror that gathered before him as he went down the long volutes of somber stairs. Slowly he descended, and a weird despair was upon him. He had slain the Vorqual, had seen it wither in death, so Nala should be saved from the morrow's sacrifice. Yet he could not believe the thing he had done." The lifting of the ancient doom was still no more than an idle myth. The twilight had begun to brighten as he passed through the slumbering city. According to the custom of Lofi, no one would be abroad for another hour. Then the priests of the Vorqual would gather for the annual rite of blood offering. Midway between the pyramid and his own palace, Lunithi was more than startled to meet the maiden Nala. Pale and ghostly, she glided by him with a swift and swaying movement, almost serpentine, which differed strangely from her habitual languor. Lunithi dared not accost her when he saw her shut, unheeding eyes like those of a somnambulist, and he was deeply awed and troubled by the serpentine ease, the unnatural surety of her motion. It reminded him of something which he feared to remember. In a turmoil of fantastic doubt and apprehension, he followed her, threading the exotic maze of Lospar with the fleet and sinuous glide of a homing serpent, Nala entered the sacred pyramid. Lunithi, less swift than the maiden, had fallen behind, and he knew not where she had gone in the myriad vaults and interior chambers, but a strange and fearsome intuition drew his steps without delay to the platform of the summit. He knew not what he should find, but his heart was drugged with an esoteric hopelessness, and he was aware of no surprise when he came forth in the many-colored dawn and beheld the thing which awaited him. The maiden Nala, or that which he knew to be Nala, was standing in the basin of evil soil above the withered remains of the Vorqual. She had undergone, and was still undergoing, a monstrous and diabolic transformation. 
Her frail, slight body had assumed a long and dragon-like form, and the tender skin was marked off in incipient scales that darkened momentarily with a mottling of baleful hues. Her head was no longer recognizable as such, and the human lineaments were flaring into a weird semicircle of pointed leaf buds. Her lower limbs had joined together, had rooted themselves in the ground. One of her arms was becoming a part of the ophidian bowl, and the other was lengthening into a scaly stem that bore the dark red bud of a sinister blossom. More and more the monstrosity took on the similitude of the Vorqual, and Lunithi, crushed by the ancient awe and dark, terrible faith of his ancestors, could feel no longer any doubt of its true identity. Soon there was no trace of Nala in the thing before him, which began to sway with a dreamy, python-like rhythm, and to utter a deep and measured sibilation, to which the plants on the lower tiers responded. He knew then that the Vorqual had returned to claim its sacrifice and preside forever above the city of Lospar and the world Lofi. The End What I enjoyed most about this tale was the wonderful range of, of colors described by Clark Ashton Smith. He truly has an incredible vocabulary, and to imagine... Each of the things that he writes down here is beautiful. His prose evocatively conjures the, the dual colors of the red and green suns and what that place might look like. I think of uh, Jack Vance's Dying Earth. I think, of, I think of Gene Wolfe's Torturer series, The Earth of the New Sun or The Book of the New Sun, The Tetralogy of the New Sun. And I also think of Zofique and of his other desert stories. As always, don't forget to like. Oh, my cat's saying hello. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and check out the links in the description below to purchase my own work, Thrilling Suspense Fantasy Volumes 1 and 2. Available now. Catch you in the next video.